My name is Dr. Christopher Dusing, aka Dr. D, and uh, this is the 12th episode of my podcast, and I am blessed to be here uh, with Misty Hines, who is an experiential therapist and transpersonal existential coach. She specializes in supporting people through the often destabilizing expressions of the dark night of the soul. I love that. She utilizes uh, eco-psychology and somatic practices to help people discover blockages uh, to their potential and uncover hidden layers to their chronic suffering. So this is Misty. We're going to spend the next 50 minutes to an hour together in the spirit of the talking cure, which is the Freudian assignment of saying everything. Uh, the talking cure at Dr. D is uncurated, uh, un unedited, and also too uh, free associative. So we shall see and trust the process and see where it goes. Yeah. Um, Misty, thank you so much uh, for doing this with me. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. So uh, this, we'll start out with the dark night of the soul. Uh, that is what stuck out to me in your bio. And I just want to land there in terms of uh, this comes from a very personal space, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I had an experience um, last year um, that uh, was really transformative for me, um, made a move out of the country, um, something that I had been wanting to do for a really long time, uh, for a number of reasons wanted to move, um, and for a number of reasons it didn't work out uh, and had to come back to the country, um, but in the process of doing that, lost nearly everything, um, lost everything that I'd had all of my life, um, really had in, in the process of making this move had really made this leap and had, um, sort of given up everything in order to do this. Uh, and so in coming back, uh, there was really this sense of, um, of, failure and also um, of such tremendous loss. Uh, and sitting in that space of, of loss and not, and not only um, feeling the sense of loss for um, uh, of all of the things that I had that I had lost, um, being in, in this home with, with nothing in it, um, which was actually this physical void state, but also being in this, um, you know, emotional voided state, um, uh, really allowed this, um, transformative, uh, place to occur. It opened up this experience for me that um, I thought I had maybe experienced before to some degree, uh, which, I, which I had, but this was something um, unlike anything I had really experienced. Um, and there was, uh, there was one day in particular that um, I had been kind of wandering around this empty house and really feeling kind of the the emptiness of um, the physical space, feeling the emptiness of the emotional space, and uh, just kind of um, leaning into that emptiness and kind of allowing it to be there. Um, and I, I picked up the uh, there was there was one book <laughs> that was left uh, that I, I still had my books. Um, packaged up but um, really that was all that was kind of left um, and there was one book that was just left in in this empty room um, really interestingly it just kind of opened up it was the Bhairava Tantra um, and, and opened up this book and just happened to be on this page about um, the word om and uh, it was it was breaking down the the meaning of um, the the mantra of Om and uh, how the the first letter of of Om A is um, corresponds to like the ultimate luminosity and 
that the second letter U corresponds to um, dynamic, creative, like ultimate dynamic creativity. And that um, when I got to the letter M, which, you know, is, is I feel really connected to with, with my own name, um, it was corresponding to um, ultimate spaciousness and an emptiness and the void. Um, and I just thought, yeah, this voided state that I am in uh, is exactly the place that I need to be leaning into. Um, and not only that, but this voided state is the place where sometimes we feel is the emptiest, but it's actually the place that we are returning to. Um, it is the place that uh, we come from and then we return that uh, is often these non-ordinary states of consciousness. Um, it's, uh, it's the beginning and the end. And there was uh, so much transformation that began in that place. That's the beginning of the story. <laughs> that's the beginning of the story. That's uh, the beginning. That's the uh -huh. beginning of the story. So that's the beginning of the leaning into the voided state. Um, what started there was this, um, was this understanding about this draw towards non-ordinary states of consciousness and the transformation and transcendence that occurs there. Um, and why we might be um, drawn towards these states in order to um, experience these, these massive um, transformations. Um, and what exactly is needed in order to experience that transformation. Um, integration uh, mm -hmm. is essential, I think, um, when we have, because, you know, one thing that I realized during that whole process was that I was engaging in a really disciplined process of uh, reflective awareness that became really like an explicit part of um, that ultimate transcendence and that was essential so um there's there's this aspect of like um really like being supported by um the skillful like intersubjective guidance during these acute states of nsc's um can really provide this um, assistance with these insights and can really like help to be transformative in these um, and, and possibly enhance like the psychological wellness. Um, so integration is so essential. So that's when I started thinking, this is really the place, this, this is really the place for me. I love uh, what you had to say about the Om symbol and the three stages there. We have the ultimate luminosity. I almost liken that to awakening. Um, mm. And then we have that dynamic creativity, which it strikes me from your personal journey, oftentimes comes from uh, the destruction, the, the burning down of the previous uh, paradigm. And then that leaves the void and not void in in a negative way uh perhaps an uncomfortable way but opens up this ultimate spaciousness it almost reminds me of a uh, purging purging a, a house that is uh cluttered and mindlessly cluttered yeah. and uh just burn it all down symbolically yeah. and then what do we do with the spaciousness i also too Love the fact a lot of people think the awakening is it. We need to awaken and that's it. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the beginning, correct? Right. Right. 
yeah exactly um yeah so if this um you know i i was thinking a lot about how we either um purposely move into these state non-ordinary non-ordinary states these these nscs um through you know psychedelics or meditation um things like that um it also uh um, sensory deprivation which i think is really interesting that's that's a um that's a path that that i think it is being explored more and that i find that really interesting um but also through non-purposeful uh ways that it can occur like through trauma you know um and through uh, NDEs, things like that. Um, so, it, it, but in these in these ways, what uh, what is occurring is that these these patterns that we've experienced, these programs that we're experiencing, this this program of socialization, are dropping to allow us then to return to this ancient wisdom that we have internally that is often being so quieted that it, it's it's forcing this self-reflection it's forcing this return to insight that uh, that exists um, and this internal knowledge that we carry all the time um, and it's that integration of that knowledge that then becomes wisdom and that's what i find so um, that's that's pithy. That's that's the ju juicy stuff. Is that that work um, finding that that knowledge and alchemizing that into wisdom? That journey is beautiful. You know, information laden culture um, on steroids on technological steroids. Uh, how we can just value this sea of information, knowledge, right? right? And perhaps we're missing the boat in terms of what is the alchemized state? How do we catalyze that transformation into wisdom? And that feeds right into uh, the integration work. I feel like there's so many parallels with this in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, makes me think how a lot of people get focused on the psychedelic or the medicine. Um, and sure, that that's a vehicle that gives you knowledge and you need uh, the internal, uh, the inner intelligence and lived experience uh, and time. I, 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 this takes time I to transform it into uh, wisdom. Does, yeah. that, does that resonate? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The time, uh, the purposeful self-reflection, um, and and that's what I think. Um, that void state, that being uh, that called to the void state, um, is is often that isolated sitting with the self. Um, mm -hmm. Very uncomfortable to a lot of people. Very, very, yeah, yeah. Um, it was Pema Chodron, I think, wrote that book about um, the places that scare you. Uh, just sitting in that discomfort, feeling the places that are scary, feeling the places that are, and and that's that's again transformation. No, no mud, no lotus. That's um, that's the that's the growth, um, and. And when I think when we're called to those places, um, that's that's so that's a beautiful thing. Um, I think that's where um, eco psychology is is so um, so special to me as well. So like the practice of eco therapy and returning to our um, connection to the planet, returning to our connection to um, our, our returning to our um, realization of our our natural uh, self 
um, rem remembering that we are nature, rewilding ourselves. Um, that whole process as a grounding um, for for the balancing of um, moving forward in that in that whole process um <clears throat> because it's it's such a it's such a balancing um it it is our balance like uh returning to our natural self is such a balance uh yeah so ecotherapy um key key in this whole process as well yeah uh, so i i love that i'd never heard the term uh rewilding ourselves and it seems to me it's a process of uh remembering or reminding ourselves of what we forget so easily in this uh contemporary um man is at the top of the hierarchy right we are master over the world um and it really removes us from a sense of spirituality uh, the the connectedness of it all uh, that that seems to me without knowing anything about ego um, or not ego eco uh, psych psychology and eco therapy uh, that seems to me like one of the tenets of it correct yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um, remembering our connection remembering that we are uh, of the natural world. Um, getting reconnected to that um all of the things that we do in the world whether it's that we that we fish or we hike or we jog or we garden or um, all of those things that that provide our connection with the planet um that those things are our grounding our um, our reconnection with um with the source that feeds us the source that is our uh, our our livelihood it's, uh, it's where we gain our life from our our, our physical life from um mm -hmm. and yeah it's it's balance for us it's a return to to a source that that we exist from so um it is there's a tremendous amount of um wellness that comes from returning to that and a tremendous amount of balance that that comes from uh, just being in nature in whatever way that you respond to uh, and that is oftentimes a, a a place to to start from yeah yeah it makes me think of uh, even to zooming out a bit how we can suffer through as as a society as as uh humankind uh what covid did uh to to us and removing us from each other and nature i, I mean i know myself uh, i was indoors and i could have gone outside for a walk however it didn't really occur to me cuz right. everything just came to me amazon all that and just the free association too that popped into my head when you talk about rewilding yourself it makes me think of wild salmon versus farm raised salmon and mm -hmm. wild salmon is one of the healthiest um, meats that you can consume and farm based salmon uh, are really toxic and we need to dye them to make them look like a wild caught salmon also makes me think of orcas I, I don't know if you've ever seen um the movie blackfish it's about orcas in captivity so orcas incredible animal they actually have a an emotional lobe in their brains that humans don't have. Uh, and when they're captive, when they're also removed from their families, because they're a familial uh, animal, uh, it's it's very, very difficult and traumatizing for them, even to the point that the fin, the fin on the fish uh, will, will uh, wither in mm -hmm. a way. And then the animals become aggressive and attack their trainers. So it's just, interesting how this ego or eco eco psychology eco therapy uh, ties into this natural uh, these natural associations on my end um i did want to just ask you though the void can can you tell me a little bit more about the void and i like to play on words too because 
it's the space that's the void. And it's almost like yourself gets voided, gets crossed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really, really, that's a really um, great way of putting it. So, um, and that's, I think what's actually so key and, and so essential is that um, the self that, that we're carrying all the time that we are so familiar with um, is what gets canceled out. Uh, and it is what allows us to, it's, it's, it's our persona that gets removed, right? This, um, um, this ego that we're so familiar with presenting um, gets canceled out. And then we get presented with this opportunity to go, well, now what? what what's existing behind that what's what's existing that um who, who's experiencing that right um who's experiencing this entire experience like but so the observer right we start to move into um the question about the observer and um uh who's observing our experience, who really are we, um, there becomes this um, entirely new narrative about uh, what, our, um, what our path is, where we've been going. Um, we start asking different questions. And uh, I think that um, that different conversation that we start having with ourselves is really key in our transformation. Um, I think that oftentimes when these things either happen upon us or we seek them out, um, it's uh, our psyche, uh, our ourselves, um, so sometimes people want to refer to it as our higher selves, um, really calling for a massive transformation, really calling for um, some really desiring stepping out into a new direction, really calling for um, a movement into or a movement back onto a path that we um, were intended to go and perhaps got um, misdirected from. You know, I think sometimes we are moving along on a path and and we get detoured and uh, sometimes that all of this programming that we are carrying around and um, that's uh, it's affecting our life and affecting our um, our choices and things like that all of that needs to drop in order for us to return to the the truth of where we are the truth of where we are going the truth of um, our intentions. Uh, and sometimes that clarity can be jarring. Uh, I think being, being in that state where none of the usual, um, programming, none of the usual, uh, conversation that you have, uh, exists anymore can be really frightening. Um, it can also be really, um, it can be really exciting and it can be really, um, it can be really joyful. It can be really joyful. And uh, I think there are times when uh, there are feelings that arise of, um, uh, alignment and that is um that's really exciting to watch that's really exciting to experience myself and it's it's exciting to watch um when other people experience it as well yeah so really what this sounds like is you died Mm, and yeah. then we're birthed again i mean or i don't know just a return to that path makes me think of uh 
book called The Four Agreements. Uh, and it says mm -hmm. that we make all these agreements. I mean, we come out, the baby comes out uh, and is is unsocialized, uncivilized, uh, mm. greedy, um, a, a greedy beast, even in a way. Babies are un, unsatiable, they're, they're yeah. hunger, right? And destructive yeah. as well. Luckily, they're so cute. Um, <laughs> And then as we we make these agreements that remove us from that infant, like that childhood um, space, that, that emptiness of a sort, and that happens really insidiously, even in our current day, all the information that we're fed. So how do we, how do we die and rebirth ourselves. It sounds like it sounds like this this void sounds like something in the psychedelic therapy community, the out of bounds uh, on yeah. higher psychedelic doses, uh, particularly ketamine. Uh, I've I've borne witness uh, to individuals going through a blowing up the matrix, uh, a dropping of, of everything into the out of bounds, literally out yeah. of bounds of the life that we know and an out of bounds that doesn't apply to language. In some ways we lose mm -hmm. language and we become infants again, who can be utterly terrified of the world because if the secure attachment with parents aren't there, the infant has annihilation anxiety. The yeah. world is going to end. And then uh, mother comes back, the infant's like, oh, wow, world to explore. <laughs> it right, sounds right. like there's some really uh, deep parallels there. Right. Uh, object permanence issue. Yeah. Um, right. Because, um, you know, the, the what's interesting about the, the void state is that it is everything and nothing. Right. It is, it's, it's all, you know, um, in terms of like going back to going back to Om when we you know when we're breaking down um, the mantras right it is it is all of creation in a state of nothingness um so when we're you know sort of invited into this state of all that is everything that is all of everything but also all of nothingness there is tremendous potential it's all potential it's and so there's this sense of um and allowing ourselves to allowing ourselves to become that state and not even just become that state but to understand that we are that state is is what is i think so essential in really experiencing that transition. So we are that state, <clears throat> we come from that state. That is our natural state of being. Um, all potential, all nothingness. And that it is, um, it is a state that, that we can return to that it's um that it's always there it's not uh it's not just something that's fleeting right it's not just something that exists you know over here or over here or you know um it's it's pure existence it's all the time uh so that's i think um that's something that um that I that I also experienced um 
during um, during another another time was um, having this sense of like uh, I don't know if if this is a place that I can come back to. You know, this seems like um, I want to return to this state, but I don't know if this is a place that I can access again. Um, and and then realizing this is this is always existent. This is this is the state of 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 existence all the time. This is just it's like it's like the universe, right? The universe is just it just is. You know, it does. It's not going to sometimes be here and sometimes not. Um, although, you know, I don't know we, what we're learning about with astrophysics and particles being, you know, sometimes here and sometimes not. I, that's, that's, out, that, that's outside of my jurisdiction. So I don't know, we could really get into a whole different conversation there. But like, mm. <laughs> in my understanding, um, <laughs> this, this, this void state um, of just of pure existence and nothingness is just it's it's accessible uh and it's mm -hmm. it's where we exist in in the ability to to transform to transform to transcend uh and by by leaning into that and realizing that this is our natural state is is hugely transformative mm -hmm. Uh, so much here. Uh, I, I'm feeling the existential vibe. I, I know that uh, the crew out at Saybrook University would dig this. Um, <laughs> and it's really interesting because we're coming back to that knowledge uh, and wisdom. And I'm going to, with your language, it was really interesting. Uh, you were there, present in it. And then all of a sudden, that's not my jurisdiction. <laughs> So it's really interesting. You kind of othered yourself away. Stick with right. me here in terms of, oh, it needs to be the physicists that have this knowledge. Right. right. That That's, true. This... That's true. And really that wisdom is within us. And it's not necessarily words or language or uh, that paradigm of knowing it's embodiment. It's, yeah. it's that inner intelligence. Uh, yeah. No, you're so right. As we're as we're discussing it, no, you're so right. You're so right. So, so one therapist, <laughs> another reframe. There, there's some good old, <laughs> there's some good old cognitive reframe. Right. It, it's right, funny right. though how insidious that can be in terms it of really oh is. wow, that's not my ju jurisdiction. Right. Oh, no, non ordinary it's... states. I don't know about those. Right. <laughs> yeah. No. When it's right no. there, it's right there. Right. Yeah. No, um, particles and astrophysics, I don't know, that's not my jurisdiction. And, you know, it's funny that you were saying othering because that's that was the part of, um, you know, the natural world that I was talking about earlier with like when we are othering ourselves from from the natural world and um, when we're othering ourselves even from, from the state of, you know, um, from the void state, whenever we're getting into that state of like othering ourselves, um, we're we're really uh we're we're moving back into that i think socialized program we're moving back into these pattern states that just oftentimes don't serve us they just oftentimes don't serve us um it's it's almost like this um i hate to i hate to call it this because i feel like it's just so over overused right now but it's almost like we're we're um logging back into this simulation state you know um just kind of moving back into this really generated state of being and um when we're really othering ourselves and that's not you know i'm not connected to the natural world i'm not connected to that that state of um, um you know a, a, a peak experience so to speak or um you know whatever it is that's come up for for me in whether it's a non-ordinary state of consciousness or whatever it is that, that I've experienced and then othering ourselves from it. So that's really interesting that you said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That tendency that we have to do that and put ourselves back into the programming uh, and how that reduces our transformative and 
our transformative processes. It's really interesting. Awakening, it's uh, that, uh, what what is the first letter of Om? That luminosity. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that ultimate um, luminosity. Absolutes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's it's not it's not one and done too. Again, I, I I think a lot of people see awakenings or transformative experiences as there it is and right. I'm there. Uh, and we know that that's not a perpetual state. If anything, the world we live in uh, and all the noise pulls us back, and we need to reawaken ourselves. Over and over and over again, and through that repetition and reinforcement, that's the continuity of it. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, and and it oh, takes yeah, all of us. You know, Om is um, the uh, believed to be the. Um, the the origin of the universe it's it's the origin it's the the origin of the sound of the universe the sound the origin of the universe um and it's it's all three of those sounds that are that's that's all of creation so it takes all three like you were saying it's the combination of those things um and it's the combination of you know total luminosity and absolute creation and absolute stillness it's everything so it's 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 manifest it's creation and it's total stillness and 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 the void so it's it's all of those things combined it takes everything it takes it takes creation and manifestation it's it's it creation in itself and it takes nothingness it's all of those things for everything to be um and i think it's in that that state that we discover real transcendence and transformation yeah. and it struck me that uh, it strikes me that westernized reductionistic uh, logic based uh, thinking and and language is the exact opposite of what's needed to really not even comprehend but hold the space and maybe it's beyond words. Uh, maybe it's it's beyond theory. Uh, maybe it's beyond our, and uh, no offense to the human brain, mm -hmm. and it's beyond the human consciousness and the human brain and this clumsy thing that we call language. I'm, I'm really curious, Misty, I want to circle back uh, to your personal experience. And this comes from a recent podcast I recorded. I with Mia Costco, who's a grief facilitator out of Vancouver, um, really had me thinking about grief processes, both from Western and Eastern philosophies. So I'm really curious about what was the grief process like in, mm. in, in your transformation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah. Uh, Take your time. No, no rush to get westernized, reductionistic about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, isolatory. Um, and uh, I think definitely. Uh, I think there was a, a purposeful um, solitude. Uh, there was a, a need to, a need for, a need for quiet, so much quiet. Uh, there was a, I, I definitely felt a need to reduce all of the noise. Uh, I remember um, being kind of struck by the fact that um, even though the house was so empty, um, 
I didn't want music or television or, um, and podcast. like my kids. Like a podcast? What's that? Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no, nothing. And um, I, I remember people wanted to visit, right? Because they wanted to, you know, be checking on me and they knew that I was kind of mm -hmm. having a hard time and so forth. Um, and and I, I was appreciative of those efforts, but I really wanted solitude. I really mm -hmm. desperately wanted solitude and reflection. Uh, and I and I think that worried people <laughs> because I wanted solitude. Um, but I, I wanted to sit with that space, that spaciousness. I really wanted I really wanted that spaciousness. I wanted to create a sense of space, even though there was so much spaciousness in in the house already, um, which I which I thought was really interesting because I, I I feel like my my programming and my patterning would tell me fill this spaciousness um, because this is this is uncomfortable and we need to have some noise in this spaciousness because this is. Uh, that's a fearful thing, especially considering everything that just happened. Um, but instead, uh, and I, I think that that's the part of the like um, really, I think, purposeful and disciplined self-reflection that it eventually, because at first I don't think I really noticed that that I was doing it. And later it became kind of this um more disciplined and purposeful self-reflection that I that I leaned into. I really leaned into this solitude and quiet and desire to to um, to feel it, to be with it, to be with uh, the the sense of loss, the um, all of the feelings that were occurring. Uh, so there was, and that was, uh, that was different from, I think, maybe past experiences. Um, and I'll, I'll attribute a lot of that to my training and to um, so many uh, teachers that I've had who've given me so much um, wisdom and so much uh, so much knowledge about and so much space of, um, so that I've learned how to be with that um, so I will definitely attribute that ability to do that um, and I think that's actually what for me created uh, that open door to this void state. Uh, had I not been able to be open to this solitude, had I not been able to be open to this spaciousness and create this spaciousness and be open to the silence, uh, be open to being, it, sit with it. Um, for me, I don't know that that space would have been available, that that void space would have been available to me. Um, I probably would have filled it with noise. I would have filled it with um, programming and so forth. So um, yeah, that's a lot of how that, that occurred for me. Or um, people would fill it for you. Or right? Right. Or algorithms would fill it for you. <laughs> right. 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 Don't don't even get me started there. <laughs> so <laughs> I, true. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of thinking about loneliness. Um, I did a panel discussion with my colleague and close friend Chris Bradshaw. Uh, shout out to him. He's finishing up his PhD. I am so proud of you, Chris. Uh <laughs> and I've been just thinking a lot about loneliness. Also, the Surgeon General brought up that we are in an epidemic of loneliness. 
And that can be the equivalent. Uh, this is off the top of my head. It can be the equivalent. I'm not sure if I'm right on the quantity. It can be the equivalent of 15 cigarettes a day. So it got me thinking, what exactly is loneliness? And I broadened out the uh, dialectic of loneliness to we have loneliness, which is a feeling. And there's two ways this can go. It can go into solitude mm -hmm. right? if it's purposeful and it's uh, and we can get comfortable with the discomfort. Right. And then on the other end, there's isolation. If it metastasizes into mm -hmm. kind of cancerous isolation, removes us from the eco, <laughs> the mm -hmm. e ecosystems that we're in, then that's where the cigarettes come in. Yeah. So when the Surgeon General says one of the things to combat this epidemic is to connect with others, paradoxically, I haven't thought about it. I can add too as well, maybe we need to become more fluent at being lonely and alone. <laughs> and how do we convert that into uh, a spiritual solitude? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's, that's really interesting. I, I, I wonder if they're going to incorporate that into the ACEs study. That's mm. I'm just curious about that. Maybe in terms of how that that's affecting. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, the way that we approach in our society, things like death, loneliness, solitude, our, our relationship to those things and how we, the, the availability for deepening our relationship with those things uh, is, is so big. It's so, it's so great. Um, we have such an opportunity to, to deepen our relationship with things like that, that with our with death and with loneliness and solitude we can change so much about our relationship to those things and what a difference it would make what a difference mm. it would make yeah not denying death uh in in the words of ernest becker in yeah. uh, his, his great book the denial of death uh, instead of running around creating these immortality projects and thinking about how our legacy is going to be, oh, is this podcast going to be successful enough uh, to leave a legacy? Uh, really, the legacy is in the here and now and in our experience of each other. Just also really strikes me like semantically with language uh, and communication. The void is right there because it's not the words we're speaking. It's it's the negative space within them, right? That allows for the next thought, cognition, feeling to manifest. Uh, because I found myself um, anxious sometimes in your silences. And I, I'm like, oh, I have to speak. I have to fill the void. And then just releasing from that just gives space for the organic process to happen. One of the things I love about psychoanalysis the free associative assignment. It's all about the void. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I loved the gestalt training that, uh, that I went through. Uh, it, wow, what a huge difference that made in just my ability to be with someone, just my ability to hold space with another person and just be and just allow them to be, and not have to do that, not have to fill that space and allow that space to exist. Um, and I, I, I realized that some time ago about how it affected my work with other people, uh, but it wasn't until recently that I realized how much it affected my ability to be with myself mm. uh, and allow mm. that space to exist with myself too. So that's that's interesting. It's just like, allowing that space to to be allowing that space to exist and yeah that might not always work in terms of podcasts and things like that but it, but yeah <laughs> the doctor thinking a lot about um thinking a lot about therapeutic presence and how can we be present with ourselves in um 
in the company of a client or not even client, another human being. Mm -hmm. And we get so caught up in the manuals, uh, the protocols, the, the, um, the knowing really mm -hmm. the knowing I, I need to know what to do with this certain diagnosis. And again, it's all right there in the therapeutic moment. No disrespect to the DSM, no disrespect right. to the medical model paradigm. And uh, let's burn it down right? and realize it's all there in the here and now, and it's within us. Now, whether we call it counter-transference, transference, transferential field, the void, uh, the presence, I feel like that's where the future of psychotherapy needs to go. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because so many young clinicians I, I see these days um, just and, and being churned out by schools of, uh, right now, uh, not able to sit with uncertainty and not able to just sit in the silence. Uh, I teach uh, young budding clinicians, if you're going to say something, uh, wait, uh, write it down on your clipboard. Why am I talking? And that's coming <laughs> from you. <laughs> You are yeah. not holding the void for, for the client. Right, right, right. Um, I really just want to zoom out while I have a eco, an eco therapist here. It's interesting, the Freudian slip I had earlier. <laughs> no therapist, but the eco therapist. If we zoom out for the last few minutes here, how do you see the world? and the macro and where we're headed uh, as as humankind. Are yeah. we in relationship with the world in a um, parasitic fashion? Oh, uh, yeah. Or I mean, absolutely. A, a, a symbiotic fashion? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think currently, overwhelmingly, we're in a, a parasitic relationship. Um what is so essential is that we move into a symbiotic relationship. Uh, and there are like the, the, the bigger ways that are important when, if we want to talk about things like addressing climate change and, you know, uh, environmental factors and things like that. But when we're talking about personal uh, relationship to the planet, um, I think what's, what's key is that um, it matters. It's like any other relationship, you know, if, if it matters to you, then you will address it, right? So if, if your relationship to the planet matters, if your relationship to just the natural world, I, you know, sometimes I don't want to even say the planet because it becomes this, this large, even sometimes political thing, but if your relationship to the natural world matters to you, uh, you'll foster it. And that just that just entails um, being more connected and realizing your essential nature. You know, that just regardless of whether you believe that, uh, that, regardless of whether you believe in something like Source or God or something like that. Uh, you know, there's a a rhythm. You know that um, are that is establishing our connection to everything uh and and that just can't be denied you know we are part of this massive natural rhythm that we are connected to and and understanding that accepting that reconnecting to that um is just um, healing for us, balancing for us. It's just like stabilizing yourself in order to do the next great thing. You know, you have to have balance in order to run. You have to have balance in order to dance. You have to have balance in order to do your next great thing. And I think that having a positive relationship with your natural world is such a great starting point for doing your next great thing you know moving forward in in your transformative goals in your life it's just it's such a 
it's such an important basis for life. Yeah, beautifully said. I um I was watching the movie The Graduate the other day, and um, with Dustin Hoffman mm -hmm. uh, from the and he's graduated from college and he feels really lost for people who haven't watched it. And uh -huh. he's, he's at his, yeah, he's at his house. He's at, you know, his father throws his party and his uncle comes up to him and says, stick with me. I'm going to trail this through is plastics. Plastics are the future. <laughs> plastics. Mm -hmm. You got to get into plastics. And this was a time when we're still hunting whales. For some reason, I'm thinking of whales today. And we're dumping shit into the seas, thinking the seas are vast enough to digest this, thinking that we can abuse Mother Nature and she'll be all right with it. Right. And perhaps, perhaps we got to pay the tax. Perhaps the world needs to burn up a bit for us to awaken. Uh, so, wow. Yeah. I, I am. I have so much more. I hope that you will come back on so that I can get to some more of this stuff. I have so many questions too about the gestalt and transpersonal uh, realms. I think those are two realms that aren't discussed enough, if at all, uh, in, in the current therapy landscape. And um, lastly, I just want to apologize to the orcas and <laughs> the wild caught salmon Thank and just you. let them know we're trying. Yeah, We're, we're, yeah. we're really yeah. trying yeah. with our with our small human brains. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for yeah. inviting me on. Yeah, such a pleasure. Again, uh, Misty Hines and uh, Dr. Deucing, Dr. D, The Talking Cure. Please tune in uh, for future episodes and go past, uh, go into the past 11 episodes as well. It's just been a beautiful journey. Really excited for the future. Thank you so much, Misty, for filling Thank the void you. with me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely.